this gets into stepping stones to very high dimensional data, not necessarily the environmental data or traffic data, but some simpler examples. Three themes are like feature selection, clustering, and classification. I'm going to start with flowers. So these are irises. Apparently, there are multiple varieties of iris. I don't even know what makes an iris an iris. But these are, this is the Virginica, Setosa, and Versicolor. And there's a data set from, I think it's the 1930s, Fisher, quantified a bunch of these irises by looking at sepal length and sepal width and then petal length and petal width to try to see if they sort of fell into different categories. So this is a way of trying to, from morphological measurements, know if these species separated out. There were measurements from 50 of each type of flower. And let's just call those X1, X2, X3, X4. Well, you could plot those for each of the different irises in space. Now we're doing four measurements. We can't easily plot in a four-dimensional space, but we could do a three-dimensional plot. So if we do sepal width, sepal length, and petal length, then we color code the points by which flower they actually came from. You can see down here that the setosa nicely separates out from the other two. So you could just from those measurements with high confidence say, okay, I did these measurements. This must be a setosa iris. The other two, maybe you'd have to tease them out in some other way. There are machine learning and data science methods that could do that. One way, and of course, we're not going to get into the details, but this will just sort of give you an idea of what types of tools might be out there. There's something called a classification tree. This would be a way of pretty much splitting out those other two types of irises. It involves taking a certain projection. In this case, we're just looking at petal width on the x-axis and petal length on the y-axis, and then we're doing these splits or cuts. So the first split says, okay, to the left of that is just the green ones. And then you do the second split uh, that goes from one side to the first split. And then you do this third split. The third split separates out most of the purple ones. I forget which ones those were. And, and then you've got the rest. So using a classification tree from measurements, you can categorize these things. So in this particular case, this was done, like I said, in, in the 30s. The features that were chosen were just sort of natural features that someone who studies plants and flowers would, would look at, uh, measurements of the sepal and measurements of the, the petal. In other cases, it's not so obvious what the features would be. And let me give an example of that. This is a built-in data set in MATLAB, but it's giving uh, ovarian cancer data. So there's, I think, 120 patients that had cancer and then about 150 that were normal. But what the data provides, it's got for each person a vector. So just a string of, of 4,000 numbers, and they each represent the expression of a gene. If we look at only three of these 4,000 dimensions, if we pick the right three, we can sort of separate out the cancer from the normal. And this is sort of a question in data analytics related to medicine is, could you do a gene test and then tell somebody this group of genes is expressing and so therefore cancer is present. What these features are, they're labeled PC1, PC2, PC3. This stands for principal component. I don't expect you to know what principal component analysis is, but I will try to give you a feeling for it, not for this example, but for different ones. We've got 4,000 different dimensions. And of course, we can't plot in 4,000 dimensions. We can plot in three. In fact, maybe in three is just the easy one for our, our minds to get around computationally. Maybe we'd want to use way more dimensions than that. But at least in this case, these three dimensions seem to extract important features that are useful for classifying done using a computational approach. Here's another one that's kind of fun. Can a computer distinguish between cats and dogs? So we've got pictures of 20 dogs on the left and 20 cats on the right. So how do we turn this into something that can be handled in terms of you know, data science and data visualization? You notice they're pretty low resolution pictures. In fact, they're 64 by 64 pixel images. But that actually means it's very rich in data. So 64 by 64, that means 4,096 pixels. Each pixel has a grayscale value. So you could think of each of these pictures, you can interpret each of them like this dog in the upper left. You can interpret that picture as a point in a 4,096 dimensional space. 
where each of the values of that vector represents the grayscale of a particular pixel. Maybe we go you know, from left to right and then back down. So we could label each of these pixels starting the upper left one down to 4,096 for each of the dogs and each of the cats. We've got all these vectors and we want to compare them. And in fact, we've got this sort of overarching question up here. Can, we com can a computer distinguish between cats and dogs? And the answer is yes, you could use the same sort of method that was applied to that gene expression. But here, maybe it has a more you know, visual interpretation word because the vectors represent pictures. So I, I want you to get this idea that, okay, I can take a picture, at least a grayscale picture, and represent it as a point in a high dimensional vector space. And then if you do this principal component analysis, this is taking two of those principal components, PCA2 and PCA4. And this is how the, you know, the cats are the dots in purple, the dogs are the dots in green, and you can look for an optimal projection. And this is a projection where we call it an optimal projection because the overlap kind of the confusion zone where you're not sure if it's a cat or a dog is the least. Uh, so I guess these are big, I don't know what you'd call these cat-like dogs or dog-like cats, but yes, you can separate them out. In fact, this is something that could be uh, coded up pretty quickly in MATLAB or Python. Now, a much more challenging one is, can you distinguish the chihuahua from the muffin? And this is a very serious problem in <laughs> image processing. No, this is just sort of fun. I mean, look at that. It's hard to know. Some of those muffins look a lot like chihuahuas. I'm not gonna do anything with this, it was a joke. Let me tell you a little bit about face recognition. This isn't, I don't think this is the actual way that face recognition is used like in our smartphones, but it is one that's easier to explain. It uses this idea of uh, eigenvectors and eigenfaces. So what do we mean? Let's start with some famous people. So we got George Clooney up there on the top five photos, Obama, Margaret Thatcher, who used to be a prime minister of Great Britain, and Matt Damon. I've chosen grayscale images of each of them, and they've got, you know, their heads are oriented about the same way. We can average these images. On the right now, we've got the average George Clooney, <laughs> average Obama, average Thatcher, and average Damon. We're going to use these averages to sort of represent the person. So what can we do with this? We can actually construct a set of vectors. It'd be like that print, what they're what called principal component analysis, but it's actually eigenvectors. These are much higher resolution than those dog and cat photos. So I don't know, maybe it's um, a million pixels each. So that means each of these points are kind of like a point in a million dimensional space. So average Clooney is probably going to be close to the location of each of the individual Clooney's. Average Obama is going to be close to each of the individual Obama's but Clooney and Obama will probably be in significantly different parts of this space. Same for Thatcher and Damon. So everybody's face is a point in a million dimensional space, just given by the number of pixels of the image. People's faces have particular features. And so we might not need a million vectors to sort of span this space. We might just need a few. So we could look at the eigen vectors. In fact, we'll look, this is just showing the first five kind of eigenfaces uh, that represent that group of uh, celebrities. And they look weird, right? It's like, uh, you kind of stare at it and you're like, okay, I kind of see everybody in each of them or not. It looks like a negative. I don't know. These are vectors that we've interpreted as images. Now we can consider not just five components, but maybe the but 20 components. Since we started with 20 faces, we'll look at 20 components in this space. And there's different ways that you could represent this. Instead of thinking of a point in some high dimensional space, for each of them, you could look at the value in each of the different eigenface directions. So for George Clooney up here, he has a slightly negative first uh, eigenface component and then a slightly negative second one, and then a positive third one, positive fourth one, more negative fifth one, and so on. Um, and it looks like their significance is kind of decreasing it as we go along. And that's, that's kind of the point. You want the first few eigenvectors. So these are actually ordered in such a way that the first few are actually the most important for distinguishing features. So that's George Clooney up here in terms of a vector. It's actually this image, this average Clooney. Here's average Obama in terms of a, a vector. Then we got average Thatcher and average Damon. So you see what's going here with Thatcher. This might be good to note. She has a large negative peak in the third component. 
whereas Damon has a large positive peak in the first component. You know, I'd be like, why are you pointing that out? Because I don't necessarily have to pick one of these celebrities and represent them. I could take anyone's image. I could take my image and see, uh, you know, people say I look exactly like George Clooney, right? So I can see how accurate that is. Or we could take Hillary Clinton and look at her image in this space and what it spans. So she has a very large first component and then a large third component. So in some sense, she's like a Thatcher plus a Damon, if you can kind of see it. So my main point here is you, you, if you take data, especially high dimensional data, like an image, you can turn it into a point in a high dimensional space. And then you could use a whole bunch of tools for how to handle data in high dimensional spaces. These blurry faces are kind of creepy, but you know, that's just how it is. Of course, for, so for you and me, since we're not famous, maybe we just need some average faces. This is from something called the Yale Face Database. They got a bunch of volunteers to have their pictures taken. And you notice these are much more careful than just sort of the randomly selected photos of uh, celebrities. They have their face, their eyes were probably lined up so they had to be at a certain place and it sort of goes to the bottom of their chin. I'm not exactly sure what the alignment was, sort of similar lighting for every, everybody. So from this database, again, you could calculate an average. I don't want it to give you nightmares, but there's the average face, at least from these images. One of the ways to distinguish people would be actually to take each of their images, subtract the average, and see what the residual is. Uh, I'm not going to show you that because it might give some nightmares. If you've got one of those phones that recognizes your face, you, you know that it seems to recognize it pretty well in a whole bunch of different lighting conditions. Again, it's not using the eigenface technique, although it possibly could, but in, in this Yale study, they actually did look at individual people in a variety of lighting conditions. So this poor guy had to, I guess, sit there while the camera and you know light was kind of going around in a bunch of different ways. So they did this for several different people to see if they could distinguish people using this eigenface approach. So this was, I think this is over a decade ago. Things have advanced to the point where I think your phone, like my smartphone seems to work. It doesn't work with the mask on. That's something they didn't anticipate. But right, you hold it up to your face and it seems to recognize, it recognizes me with and without glasses. I think it's looking for eyes. It's actually looking for landmarks and calculating distances. And But this is a, so it's, it's not the same approach as we're talking about here. The first attempts at doing facial recognition did use this. So if you look up the term eigenfaces, uh, you could find out more about it. Just to give some more examples of some high dimensional data, there was this interesting story of a guy who supposedly hacked OkCupid to find true love. There are these dating websites where you post a profile and it tries to match you up. This one guy was a mathematician, I think at UCLA, a grad student with apparently plenty of time on his hands. He found that based on the answers he gave, he seemed to be going to certain clusters of uh, women that he was looking to date. Um, and he wanted to sort of hack the system to find sort of the perfect match. So what he did, I, I don't know how he did this, but he was able to find clusters of women who gave similar answers and he gave them all names. So people who thought that uh, God was important to them, they were you know, really high on this list. Other people that seemed to uh, have a mid-sized dog that they loved, that's the dog group. This is related to something called clustering where you can find points in a large dimensional space. And here this, the space is, how did you answer a question? And I don't know, maybe the questionnaire is a hundred questions long. So the, every person is represented as a point in a hundred dimensional space. And there are ways to find clusters naturally. And this is just showing a projection into three different dimensions, three, three different questions of different groups. Um, I forget which group he was actually looking for. I know at some point he decided he was not interested in what he called the tattoo group. Um, he did find somebody. So if you want to, you could read the story. I think it's, it's not behind a paywall or anything. And if you know the song, Love is, a, Love is a Data Field? I don't know. You could also take words and write words in terms of a high dimensional space where related words will be close together. So for example, all these dots here represent a word. And we're looking in a you know, three-dimensional projection here. 
And you'll notice the word minute and the word running are in sort of the same part of this globular cluster. And why is that? Because whenever we talk about running or like say speed of running, we often describe it in minutes. Like, oh, it took me seven and a half minutes to run a mile. It takes me longer, but this idea of words being in a high dimensional ve vector space, it's not as simple as the eigenvector approach, if eigenvectors are even simple. This involves doing really cutting edge things in machine learning, like neural networks and using neural networks that basically look at a bunch of text. They're able to see which words are associated with other words. So if two words uh, seem to be related to each other, they're going to be close together in this plot. If two words are described very different things in terms of meaning, they'll be very far away. And this is being used by all kinds of things. I don't know how many of you have seen those ads or have used one of the um, tools like Grammarly. Grammarly does things like this. It even gives you helpful advice like check your tone. Like, so not only is it uh, looking at words, but it's looking at whole phrases and saying, okay, this phrase lives in this thing of this isn't a good tone. You need a more confident tone, which is in this other slightly different part of the space of words. So it suggests things for you. In fact, you could even get advice on how to write your resume. There's all kinds of tools now. Like you could, I think you have something automatically read your resume and give it a score of, you know, how awesome it is or how much it'll get people attention. I think I've heard that on average, uh, resumes are seen for only seven seconds before someone makes a decision about it. So you, that means you need some powerful words or whatever HR is looking for up, up near the top. I wanted to just mention final thing here. One of the things we have here at Virginia Tech are, we have a whole group that's dedicated to data visualization. And we even have ways of doing immersive data visualization. So if you wanted to view some kind of abstract thing, like down here on the bottom, I don't know what this is. It looks like some kind of mathematical object. You can go into a room and actually see it. It'll track where your head's moving. So you're not necessarily wearing goggles. You could just, it's just tracking where your head's moving. So everyone gets to experience it as well. It's called a cave. In the upper right here, this is also a cave, but being used to describe some uh, environmental data. So you can kind of walk through it together. And it's really cool. We also have something called the cube that's like surrounds. You have a surrounding uh, screen, but they, you could also have three-dimensional sound they have a speaker system where they can make sounds sound like they're coming from anywhere. So if you think of like a very multi-dimensional way of taking in data and trying to look for patterns, we have that here. I don't know if we've, many of us have, have, have used it yet, but I think as data gets more complicated, maybe these kinds of things might be more used. All right. I'd like to know what your thoughts are. Just any questions or any, any, any comments? Please share your thoughts in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. I've got extra information and the links in the description.